We've really covered a lot of ground in developing algorithms that solve linear systems. We started with a really good core with Gaussian reduction, and, and we made the system less vulnerable to data-driven problems by using partial pivoting and by using scaled pivoting. And then we improved the efficiency even further by using linked lists, which allowed us to interchange rows without physically moving the rows at all, uh, just changing a index associated with it. Uh, we've studied counting the cost of our algorithm, and we have yet one more improvement that we're going to entertain, and that is taking advantage of the structure of the matrix itself. Uh, we're going to try to make improvements both in the computation time and in the storage that's required, you know, with, particularly with large systems, when we can take advantage of systematic locations of zeros. Uh, and so let's go ahead and give that a try. Let's go back to our tri-diagonal system. That's the one that had a major diagonal, had a super diagonal, had a sub-diagonal, but zeros were present everywhere else. Now if you imagine running a matrix like that through the uh, algorithms that we've used so far, we are going to be doing a lot of computations of zeros. That seems like a waste. We'll also be storing those zeros and that seems like a waste of memory. So we're going to try to improve both of those aspects of this computation, starting with improving the computation uh, time or the computation work. So this kind of tridiagonal system comes up frequently in solving differential equations. We're going to see an application of that in the last week of the course. The tridiagonal systems, as we mentioned earlier, are a special case of banded matrices where you could have maybe five diagonals or seven or more. And that whole subject belongs to a class of matrices that we call sparse matrices. That just means there's lots of zeros in the matrix. Now I'd like to go back to our triangularization algorithm and add a stipulation that matches our tridiagonal matrices. Here on the left in this bracketed form, I've set up a condition on the elements of A that if the row and the column position differ more than one, so if, they're, if the difference between the two of them in absolute value exceeds one, then that value is going to be a zero. And if the values differ by either one or zero in absolute value, then you might have some non-zero entry. Can we take advantage of this criteria to make our triangularization algorithm easier? And the answer is yes, we can. If you study this closer, this outer for loop is walking down the main diagonal of the matrix. We stop short one row from the bottom because we only need to worry about triangularization up to that second to last row. On the second for loop, we are playing with the rows, and in the third for loop, we're playing with the columns. Let's take a look at the core processing that happens with the row reduction. The first thing we have to do is come up with a multiplication or a scaling factor of the row that will be modifying. This computation itself is the Gaussian reduction arithmetic. Now let's take a close look at the indices on this loop. We've got j going from k, this k up here, to n, which is our number of rows. We are using a, k, j in this portion of the formula. We, we have by requirement that if the row and column indices differ by more than one, then that value is zero. So that means if k and j, in this case, differ by more than one, this whole expression is going to produce a zero. Well, looking at the for loop, we already have j starting at k, which means a kk is the first term that shows up. Well, that one could be non-zero. And when we loop around the next time, j will be k plus 1, and we will be using the element a k, k plus 1. Well, that could legitimately be non-zero also. The next pass we take, j is k plus 2, which necessarily makes that element 0. It makes the multiplication 0, so there's no contribution of that term, and we only end up with a 
sub i j. Now we are replacing memory location a i j with itself if this portion is zero. So what is the point of that? It doesn't produce any change in the data whatsoever. So there's really no point in doing this for loop beyond k plus 1. Once you get to k plus 2, you might as well quit. Well, that means this is really turned into a two-step loop. We could just write down those two lines of code rather than using a for loop at all. Now let's take another look at this i loop. i goes from k plus 1 to n and take a look how it is utilized. Well, here we are, we are using a i k. i is starting with k plus 1. That's okay, a k plus 1 and k could be non-zero. But on the very next pass, i will be k plus 2. That causes these two indices to differ by more than one. Therefore, the numerator will be zero. That means for every pass of this loop other than the first, our multiplier will be zero. So for each of those, if this multiplier is zero, again, this expression doesn't produce a thing, and we end up clobbering aij with itself, which is useless. So we might as well make this a one-pass loop and just loop from i equals k plus 1 to k plus 1. Let's see what that would look like, uh, highlighting that in red. Here we have the i equals k plus 1 to k plus 1, and we are looping from j equals k to k plus 1. Two-pass loop, one-pass loop, nothing else has changed and we have a lot less work going on. Well, let's just, instead of using loops, let's just write out those two lines, and we will write out the set of code for only i equal to k plus 1. There's no reason to put a loop there at all. If we do that, this is what we get, and these are the only steps that survive uh, the reduction in the for looping process. Now, if you look even closer at this one that I have indicated here, if you plug in this multiplier, so this multiplier has AKK in the divisor, and then we turn around by multiplying by AKK. That means those two terms are going to cancel. And the only thing we'll have left is AK plus 1 and K on this end of it. But look, we're subtracting that from AK plus 1 and K, which means this red circled entry is going to necessarily be zero. Well, that makes sense. I mean, this is part of the Gaussian elimination, that very first element we were trying to make zero. That was the whole point in triangularizing the matrix, is force that particular entry to zero. Well, why not just say so? Let's just state it or put it equal to zero, since it's hanging there by itself, and that will be less computations as well. So we have just boiled this algorithm down to a single pass, k equals 1 to n minus 1. We have one computation here. We have two more here, two more here. So we have a total of five uh, floating point operations, and we only pass through n minus 1 time. This is going to be an order of n algorithm. Do the math, write it down. You'll end up with a linear expression in n, and that makes it an order of n uh, calculation. Well, we should take advantage of that and see if we can't make the whole algorithm cheaper. Well, we need to calculate the rank in this because we, we don't want to try to solve it if we end up having a problem with the rank. So a rank calculation is going to end up being uh, order of n anyway because we're just checking the diagonal. So that's no problem. And we need to take a look at the back substitution as well and I'll bet you that the same thing is going to happen with this code that's indicated in red to the back substitution as it did with the triangularization code. Now you're going to get to figure that out rather than me, so, uh, so take your hand at it. And what you're going to find out is this is also an order of n rather than order of n squared uh, algorithm when you have a tridiagonal system. So I want you to roll that all together into homework 2.3a. We're going to go back to the easier homework 2.1 where we didn't do our partial or scale pivoting. And, uh, and so we'll just use this, this simpler version of it. So I've got a new data set for you called a3.xl. 
and it'll work fine on the 2.1 logic, and it's also tridiagonal. So what you need to do is load that matrix, revise the code to triangularize the code in place, also make sure you do the back substitution in an order of n manner, and come up with the actual solution. Now, as usual, I want to see the matrix A, I want to see the vector B after you've done the transformation. I'd like to see the rank and the solution vector as part of the homework process. Uh, so there's your next assignment. Uh, good luck. So one quick more topic that I'm sneaking in on you. The other banded systems do have applications. Uh, the book does discuss them. We're going to skip over them as well as block matrices, which makes me kind of sad because block matrices are really important and have great applications. Uh, it's really just a way of taking a big matrix and breaking it into logical pieces that themselves have value looking at in a sort of a sub-matrix manner. But we can't do everything this quarter, so we'll skip that one. And uh, But you may see it again in other higher level math classes if you choose to take them. So with that, we are going to uh, end the session, and we will pick up more efficiency with uh, sparse matrices in section 2.3b.